everyone. Welcome to the podcast. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Robert Wagner, a lucid dreaming expert, author of two best-selling books called Lucid Dreaming Gateway to Inner Self and Lucid Dreaming Plain and Simple. Robert has nearly 50 years of lucid dreaming experience. It's safe to say he's a black belt in lucid dreaming. He has been interviewed or consulted about the practice of lucid dreaming by CNN, CBS News and ABC News. Robert frequently speaks on the science and practice of lucid dreaming at international dream conferences, workshops and universities. In today's episode, we're going to do a deep dive in all things related to lucid dreaming, including basics of lucid dreaming, such as who controls and creates the dream landscape and content, who are the dream characters and so much more. Then we're going to delve into more complex concepts such as unlocking the secrets of our existence and consciousness through lucid dreaming, including the mystery of God. Can lucid dreaming help us to meet, know and meet God? We're also going to talk about the science of lucid dreaming. How long has science been studying lucid dreaming and what are the more recent scientific developments in lucid dreaming research and technology? We're also going to get Robert's expert opinion on recent advent of devices and gadgets and pills on the market to induce lucid dreaming states. How safe and effective are they? Next topic is one of my favorites, which is the movie Inception, starring Leonardo DiCaprio, a classic cult movie that showcases lucid dreaming as a technology that can be used for nefarious purposes. We're going to get Robert's viewpoint on how true to reality the lucid dreaming concepts depicted in that movie really are. For those who have seen the movie, I'm really curious to know what Robert thinks about the ending scene of the movie. So if this sounds good to you, grab a cup of coffee or tea, sit back and relax, as we learn from the master of lucid dreaming himself, Robert Wagner. Welcome to the podcast, Robert. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, my pleasure. I'm so honored to have you because I've followed your work for many years and I subscribe to your, uh, uh, you know, that quarterly online magazine called Lucid Dreaming Experience. And I have done so for many years. It's such a great resource and you generously share it with for free. So for all those lucid dreamers out there, I highly recommend great resource. <laughs> And, you know, if, um, in my view, you are the godfather of modern day lucid dreaming. <laughs> You've been doing it for nearly 50 years now, you know, your lucid dreaming practice. You've written best-selling, you know, books. Uh, your first one is, I think, uh, a book that every lucid dreamer knows about, which is, you know, the inner self, uh, the gateway to inner self, lucid dreaming gateway to inner self and then your second book is our uh, lucid dreaming plain and simple so yeah really great books so helpful I truly feel that uh, lucid dreaming uh, more than anything else I can think of is uh, you know a very powerful tool for us to understand our consciousness God you know our uh, subconscious mind and so much more and uh, having said that I'm fr I'm a frustratingly unsuccessful lucid dreamer so I'm hoping after this podcast I'm going to spontaneously have a lucid dream and <laughs> recharge my lucid dreaming practice so I have envy of anyone who can do it on the regular because I feel like it allows you that um, pathway to have your you know, important questions answered and also gives you these tools, you know, like manifesting, manifesting, healing and whatnot. The list goes on and we'll get into all of that. So I thought what we can do is perhaps we can start from the start, which is how did you get into uh, lucid dreaming? And from there, if you could talk us to uh, talk us through some some of the basics of lucid dreaming, just for people out there who are listening, who might know a little bit about lucid dreaming, but are not that familiar and, you know, would like to get inspired by, you know, <laughs> this podcast can you give us the basics such as you know what is lucid dreaming uh, compared to astral projection versus you know the vivid dreams that we all have and premonition like dreams and who's creating the the dream space you know the landscape like when we go to sleep and we enter a dream lucid or otherwise we find ourselves with this landscape is already laid out for us the character's already there so who's doing that and you know things like uh, who's controlling the dream Great, uh, wonderful questions. Uh, we could spend probably the whole uh, podcast talking about just those uh, four areas. 
But just to tell you a bit about my story, um, I realized that I had a very powerful dream life uh, as a little kid. Uh, I would just have amazing dreams. Sometimes I'd have dreams where someone would say something in the dream and I'd recall it waking up. And, and then five hours later on the playground, one of my little playmates would say that exact phrase. And I thought, wow, how, how can that happen? How, how can these precognitive elements occur in the dream and then occur in waking reality hours later? And so I, I just had a kind of a fascinating uh, dream life. Now, when I think about it, my very first spontaneous lucid dream happened when I was probably 10 or 11 years old. Um, so I, I was in the uh, public library looking at the books. And all of a sudden, as I'm looking at the books, I notice something is moving around and I look over and a little baby Tyrannosaurus Rex is walking through the book stacks. And even at age 10 or 11, I thought, wait a second, how can this be? Dinosaurs are, are extinct. But yet I was seeing this little T-Rex uh, walking through the public library. And so at that moment, I realized the only thing that explains this is that I'm dreaming. I have to be dreaming. This is a dream. And so I told myself, okay, if this is a dream, then I can wake up. And then I told myself to wake up and I woke up in bed. And I proved to myself that yes, I had been dreaming, but I had been consciously aware, you know, for 30 seconds or whatever uh, in, in my very first lucid dream. So, so I knew it was possible. And it was probably uh, six years after that, I was reading a book by Carlos Castaneda. He was a UCLA graduate student in anthropology. And he had gone out to study psychotropic plants like peyote and mescaline. And he met a shaman named Don Juan. And in this book, uh, Journey to Ixlan, Don Juan suggested to him that he find his hands in the dream state and become consciously aware of dreaming. And, and I thought, what? You, you can become aware within a dream? Wait, wait. And so there wasn't really a technique. And, and so what I did, each night before I'd go to sleep, I'd just look at my hands while, while I told myself, tonight in my dreams, I'll see my hands and realize I'm dreaming. Tonight in my dreams, I'll see my hands and realize I'm dreaming. And I'd do that for five minutes and fall asleep. And when I'd wake up, I'd think, oh, did I dream of my hands? But anyway, so what worked is that I did this for three nights in a row. And on the third night, I'm walking through my high school hallway because I'm in high school at the time. And all of a sudden, my hands popped right in front of my face. And I thought, oh, my hands, this is a dream. I'm dreaming this. Mm -hmm. And that's how I taught myself to become lucidly aware, went on to just have an incredible lucid dream. And this was five years before the scientific evidence for lucid dreaming came out. So, so that's how I got started in the lucid dreaming. And I don't know if you've already mentioned this, but how old were you when you had that initial dream? And then when you came across, you know, this information about being awakened in your dream is a real thing. Right. So I, I had my first spontaneous one. I was probably 10 or 11 years old. And then I had my first consciously induced one by looking at my hands before I went to sleep and telling myself in my dreams of hands and was a dream. That in, um, I was 17 years old, and that was the same summer that the first scientific solution um, came occurred at the University of Hall in England. And so it's kind of weird to think that, boy, that same spring, uh, having that experience also scientifically valid. Sorry, just getting, you just got cut out there a little bit. Um, can you just repeat the last bit again? Um, yeah. So, so interesting to think that I had that experience in 1975 in the spring. At the same time at the University of Hall in England, they were getting right. that same sort of first scientific evidence. Clicking on my Wi-Fi again, just to get, get it see. to sort of pay attention, like wake okay. up wake up internet connection and don't go to sleep okay. on me all right is that i think that's better isn't it yeah it sounds better 
Yeah. Okay. So hopefully, um, so basically what you were saying there, uh, unfortunately we had a technical issue, um, but what you're saying there is that your, mo uh, your first, you know, lucid dream uh, experience that you could call it a lucid dream was in 1975 and you were 17 years of age, correct? That's right. That's right. Yeah. And do you think it's, um, because I always struggle with lucid dreaming, uh, I'm actually weirdly, uh, Rob, I'm really good with astral projection, but I can't do lucid dreaming at almost like it's so inconsistent that I go years without having a lucid dream and I go, and that's why I get, I get very demoralized and I uh, sort of stop having a practice and then I get interested again and I'll start doing one practices again. But yeah, it's really hard. So I wonder, because you were so young that, children probably naturally have lucid dreams that they don't even know if, that they're having a lucid dream because they don't have any point of reference. So because you started so young, do you think that's helped you to sort of really, uh, you know, have a solid uh, experience in this area? You know, it's interesting. Um, around the time that I started to consciously induce lucid dreams, I also started to have the occasional outer body experience. Mm -hmm. and, and so so uh, here's what would happen. I'd be laying in bed, getting ready to go to sleep. And all of a sudden, I would hear this energy and buzzing around my body, oftentimes really around my head. And then sometimes I would notice that I was seeing the bedroom from six feet above my bed. So how, how could that be? Because I'm in bed. How can I be viewing the bedroom from, from the ceiling? And, and so... Uh, you know, for me, um, out of bodies uh, with all the noise and the energy and the buzzing and humming, they seemed a little bit uncomfortable. You know, I, I didn't care for them. By contrast, a lucid dream means you realize within a dream that you're dreaming. And so, you know, you might see the Queen of England walking down your sidewalk and think, oh, what's the Queen doing here? And, and then you become lucidly aware. So, so by contrast, lucid dreaming seemed easy, breezy, and fun, and out of bodies, in my opinion, seemed a little bit, you know, uh, a, a little bit strange and, and odd. And so I, I think uh, for some of us, then we just decide to go down a certain path. Uh, some of us go down the lucid, lucid dreaming path and just uh, focus on that, and then mm -hmm. others uh, seem to tend towards the uh, out of body experience. I have to say my um, uh, astral projection experiences came spontaneously and I never, w I never had to make them happen. I was in fact, not even thinking about it, but when I was having them, I was really happy about it. I was like, oh, whoa, this is something interesting. And, um, but I feel like they don't, they don't, they're not as powerful as a tool as lucid dreaming can be because lucid dreaming can give you real insights into your subconscious conscious and, you know, help you answer the bigger questions in life and heal parts of your life. So, so astral projection for me, it just came, comes naturally. Uh, I don't even have to do anything to make it happen. So I, yeah, I, yeah, I really want to be a lucid dreamer because I think the potential there is so enormous. So perhaps, um, at this point you can talk about for those of us, uh, of us out there who know a little bit about lucid dreaming, or maybe somebody's just curious and they know nearly nothing, let's let's g give them some basics. Right. So, so a lucid dream is any dream in which you realize within the dream that you're dreaming. So, for example, you might see your Uncle Joe and then think, wait a second, Uncle Joe passed away four years ago. How, how can this be? And that's when you realize, oh, I'm, I must be dreaming. That's the only explanation here. And so a lucid dream, you literally stop and think, wait, this is too strange. This is a dream. I'm dreaming this. And so once you know you're dreaming, uh, then you can decide what you want to do. You can talk to a dream figure, walk around the corner, do whatever you want to do. But I hate to say that you control the lucid dream because I, I don't really think you control the lucid dream. Instead, I think you direct and influence your stuff in dream space. So, so that's what a dream is. Now, now by contrast, an out-of-body experience, um, when, when you hear people talk about it, sometimes someone will say, oh, they got into a horrible car accident, and suddenly they found themselves floating 20 feet above the car accident. And they see the ambulance come, and, and the people rescue them and try to get their heart going again. And suddenly they find themselves back in their body. And, and that would be an out-of-body experience. So, so again, um, 
a lucid dream, you realize within the dream you're dreaming, but an OBE could happen when there's a medical emergency. It might happen as you're falling asleep and hear all this humming and buzzing around your body, or it might happen, um, you know, uh, for some people it happens without all the humming and buzzing. They just separate. Sometimes they feel like they shoot out or fall through or they roll out. And, and that's how they have their out-of-body experiences. So there are some similarities um, because they're non-physical states, um, but it's kind of like a house cat and a mountain lion. They're both kind of similar. They're in the feline family, but um, you know, you, you're happy to have your house cat come home. You won't want to have a mountain lion uh, live with you if that's the case. But they're, they're different phenomenon. Uh, now, it is possible, um, if you're good at, at one, to transfer to the other. And, and so um, I'll just explain how um, uh, I decided to go doing that. Mm -hmm. I began to think of out-of-bodies and lucid dreams and other states of consciousness like hypnosis and trance and various things as kind of on some sort of a continuum of awareness. And all you had to do was shift your awareness and you could move from one state to another. And so in a lucid dream, um, if you wanted to play around with this, first you'd become lucidly aware, you'd stabilize the lucid dream, you don't want to get too excited. And then you would announce that now you want to go to the next form or the next level. And when I stop in a lucid dream and announce now, now take me to the next form or take me to the next level. Normally what happens is I find myself suddenly in the house that I'm sleeping in and uh, there's nothing dreamy about it. It all seems very uh, real and lifelike and then I can go explore the neighborhood or do whatever. And so I think you can do the same thing from the OBE state. Uh, if you focus on and announce that now I want to go to a lucid dream state, you'll feel consciousness moving uh, because of the nature of your focused intent into a lucid dream. So, so, so give that a try, Rima, and, and see what happens. Okay. So my um, connection is coming up as unstable again. So fingers crossed. Um, it's, a, it's a bit worrisome that Kenny, you, you've just frozen. Oh, no, it's doing it again. Oh dear. Um, sorry, we froze again. This is, yeah, it's quite worrisome that it's doing that. Are you, can you hear me? Uh, can you hear? Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, sorry, the internet's playing up again. Okay. Sorry about that technical uh, hiccup. So, Rob, you were saying that. Um, I think oh, I was asking about dream characters, that there tend to be uh, different categories of dream characters, those that are real people that we encounter in our dreams. And then we have a complete strangers who come up in our dreams. So in your lucid dreaming practice, what have you discovered that allows you to uh, understand, you know, that sort of whole categories of uh, characters and what they mean to us? Right. So, so what I try to get across to people is in lucid dreaming, because you're consciously aware of dreaming, mm -hmm. then you can explore and experiment within the lucid dream. And so that gives you an opportunity to interact with the dream figures. Mm -hmm. And what you'll find, and this is what a lot of uh, lucid dreamers have found, is that all dream figures are not created equal, that there's different types of dream figures and that you have to be you'll see it in how they respond. For example, uh, some dream figures, you'll ask them a question and they just have no capacity to respond. They don't even look you in the eye. Other uh, dream figures, you'll ask them a question and they'll respond uh, with a very convincing answer. In fact, it's kind of funny. Sometimes a lucid dreamer will say, hey, do you know I'm dreaming this? And the dream figure will respond, how do you know I'm not dreaming this? And then the lucid dreamer will say, well, look, I can fly. And the dream trick character will say, well, look, I can fly too. And so you can get into these kind of uh, interactions with some of the higher level dream figures about whose lucid dream it is. 
But beyond that, you also get into other issues like uh, meeting deceased dream figures. Mm -hmm. So you'll meet someone, oh, that's grandma, but grandma passed away 10 years ago. And now you've met a new type of dream figure. So is that a symbol of your grief or, or your loss or your memories of grandma? Or is that grandmother as an after death spiritual uh, figure? Mm -hmm. And so by asking questions in the lucid dream, sometimes you'll learn something from grandma that you consciously were never aware of and you can wake up and confirm it. So because of this, you can see that there's all sorts of levels of dream figures and in lucid dreaming, at least, we have a chance to uh, get into that and explore it more deeply. So from your experience, when we have, uh, you know, past like relatives have passed on, um, you know, and they appear to us and they give us this amazing information that we know that we would not have known otherwise. So it could not just be, you know, conjured up from our subconscious or even unconscious mind. So do you know if we are really connecting with them? And if so, then which part of them are we really connecting with? Is it their larger awareness? You know how you call it the larger awareness, their higher self, you know, you can... Uh, there's so many different terminology for that concept. Yeah. You know, that that is a million dollar question. Uh, you might, uh, again, just be connecting with your own larger awareness. And, and through the agency of this deceased dream figure, learn something outside of your own knowing. And it's not necessarily coming through uh, someone who's deceased in the after death state but it might be somebody who's deceased in the after death state. It's almost impossible to know. All that you can do is confirm that the information that you received uh, from that dream figure uh, proved later to be valid and that there was no way that you knew that you could know it uh, in advance. Also, you can do it sometimes uh, when the uh, dream figure gives you information about future events and then you have to wait and wait for that to occur. And, and uh, sometimes those are confirmed as well. But you have a good point. It's in many respects almost impossible to know whether the information comes from an after death figure or from your own deeper inner knowledge. Yeah, because there's so many questions buried within all of this, because, you know, if we think of ourselves as not an individual, but a stream of consciousness, then we could just be tapping into that, you know, stream of consciousness. And the deceased relative is just part of that stream of consciousness, just like as we are, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, it's, as I went deeper into lucid dreaming, um, I realized that what lucid dreaming shows us at its very deepest is what I call the interconnected oneness, mm -hmm. that all of us exist within an interconnected oneness. And even though we give ourselves names and, and um, have whole sorts of belief systems and, and our own ways of viewing and thinking about the world, um, at a deeper level, we exist as part of the interconnected oneness. And uh, where where we exist within that interconnected oneness, it's it's um, just kind of a uh, a dream. It's kind of a shimmera itself. Mm. So one of the facets of uh, lucid dreaming is that you come across it's a it's a really powerful tool to you know do shadow work. You know, which for those who don't know, it's basically you know um, well this is my high level understanding, but I'm sure you can talk about it in a more intelligent manner. But you know, it basically allows us to face that aspects of us that are you know not easy for us to accept. You know, it's the it's the darker side of our nature that we tend to reject because that's how we are programmed from you know, a young age. So with um, those type of dreams where you have aspects of your shadow self coming up to you, whether in a, in a form of a scary person and all of that. So you know how, so uh, talk, uh, talk us through some of that, uh, what your, your experiences have been through that. And also one of the questions I had around that is that you know, when, you're, um, when you're coming across these aspects of your own self in a dream state, you can then bring that back into the waking realm and sort of apply that knowledge to your waking realm as well. And if so, then are we basically saying that every person that we know in our life or come across is an aspect of ourselves? Well, what we could say uh, is this, is that 
even though right now I'm relating to you, uh, Rima, uh, I'm relating to my idea of you. I, I honestly don't know you. I don't know, you know your deepest, deepest self. And I relate to my idea of you. And so in some regards, uh, you can say, well, no, you're relating to me. And you begin to see that there's this uh, intermingling of uh, information that is getting filtered through my belief system and, and our perceptual system. So, so in some regards, you could say that in many respects, we, we, never, uh, we never meet another person truly fully. In, a, in some sort of sense, we meet a reflection of our view of them and interact with the reflection and not the person themselves. But I think what's interesting about lucid dreaming is it shows us about how in some regards um, we help to create the experience and then relate to it. And, and so in a lucid dream, you know, I could uh, make a red Ferrari appear in the garage and, and then when I open up the garage, there's a red Ferrari. And so I could see that kind of creative aspect of intending that or expecting and believing it and then having it occur. But in a lucid dream also, if I met an angry character, like one time I became lucidly aware and there was this angry dog snarling. It was this Doberman. It was, it's snarling. I could see its teeth. It looked like it wanted to lunge up, you know, and attack me. But I realized, oh, this is a dream. I'm dreaming this. And that therefore this is a dream Doberman. And so, so here's what I did. I sent it what it lacked. So it seemed full of anger and hate. And so I sent it love and compassion. And as I did that in the lucid dream, all of a sudden the Doberman began to shrink and shrink and shrink as I sent it more love and compassion until it became a little dachshund like we had when I was a kid growing up in Kansas. And then I reached down and picked up the dachshund and went flying around the lucid dream. So, so what I'm trying to get across here is that when I change my mind about the dream figure and send it different kind of energy and watch it change, then I realize it's a projection of my mind. And that's why when I interact with an angry zombie in a lucid dream and I send it what it lacks and watch it change, then I know that, oh, it's not really a zombie in some netherworld coming to get me or some demon who came up from the hell realms or something like that. It's some aspect of me uh, that needs to be uh, understood and is trying to communicate with me. And, and so, so that's what you learn when you become a lucid dreamer. So, so it's, it's a little bit complicated, but I hope you get the basic point mm -hmm. is you begin to see that, that you're connected to the experience that you're experiencing and so the, the issue isn't out there as much as the issue is in here. Now, that makes a lot of sense, actually. And that, that has actually cleared up a confusion I had, especially the part where I asked you about, you know, if in, if, our, if in our waking life, every person that we come across is to be treated as an aspect of ourselves. And I couldn't really sort of uh, consolidate that inside my own mind because uh, that's kind of suggesting that we're the only ones here and everybody else is just, you know, there for us to serve yeah so what you said makes a lot of sense that yes that person is a person in their own right but how we see them is a projection of our own belief system our own experiences you know all of that so in the same vein what you're saying about the you know the shadow self aspect that we come across in our dreams are also uh they change in inside our dream as as soon as we uh, see them differently, perceive them differently. Right. So, so, so uh, this is a really important point uh, for lucid dreamers. Oftentimes, lucid dreamers, you'll you'll hear people talk about, oh, a lucid dream means you control the dream and and all this kind of stuff. And and what I try to get across is, lucid dreaming is really about more aware relating. Mm -hmm. It's you relate to what you're experiencing with greater awareness. And so when I realize that I'm not actually relating to Rima as Rima understands herself, but I'm, I'm relating to my own projection about Australian young women and all this and that, whatever belief mindset that I'm filtering it through, 
then all of a sudden, I have a much more uh, honest understanding of of what what's going on here, yeah. and and so so that's one thing that I love about lucid dreaming. It helps us pierce our own assumptions, and and get beyond those own, our own assumptions and start to deal with with our part of the equation uh, more thoughtfully. Yeah, no, that's really helpful, actually. That really clears up a lot for me. And um, I want to ask you, you know, with regards to, you know, how you're saying we're not controlling the dream. It's more about how we are reacting to the dream and the learnings that come from it. And our uh, uh, awareness aspect is really important, how aware we are in the dream. So who is then creating the dream? Who's putting up this lovely little, you know, narrative uh, and all these creating all these lovely characters for us to have these interactions with and learn and grow from? You know, uh, that is another wonderful question. Uh, so what I would say is that dreaming is actually probably more complex than waking life. And um, it, once you get deeper into it, you'll realize that it's more complex. Because in a lucid dream, uh, you can realize that, so I can create a Ferrari and go find it in that garage and I can do this, that, and the other. But what I've also realized is that I can ignore all the dream figures and ignore the dream setting and shout out a question to what I call the larger awareness and hear a response or sometimes see a response or sometimes the entire lucid dream will change in response to my request or my question. And, and so the reason I bring that up is all of a sudden I begin to see that there's a higher level creativity than the one that Robert Wagoner, Lucid Dreamer, uh, can create. Um, like one time I became lucidly aware and I announced, hey dream, show me my life as if it was a painting. And, and suddenly in the sky above me appears an 80 foot by 30 foot painting. That, that's my life. Uh, and it happened in a microsecond. Wow. The amount of creativity that had to occur in that little microsecond between my request and its appearance just shows that this new level of creativity that you can engage in a lucid dream. And so I call it my larger awareness, but of course it's, it's me, but it's not the me that I normally focus on. So the ego self focuses on, you know, interacting with the physical realm and the waking self, you know, is kind of behind the ego self consciously uh, uh, deliberating about various things. But in the lucid dream, when I interact with this larger awareness, then I just see that, oh my God, there's a whole nother realm of creativity uh, that, that normally we don't tap into. And why don't we tap into it is because we don't know it's there or we have basically become uh, unaware of, of that amazing ability within us. Yeah, no, I totally agree. I wish this was the kind of thing that was taught to us from a very young age, because I feel the younger you start, the better you'll uh, you'll be at it. And the more um, uh, uh, intelligently you'll be able to use this capability, it's, you know, it's not just to, uh, you know, for fun, you know, it is fun, but, you know, the, the potential for it to enhance our lives is just mind blowing. So maybe this is a good segue into uh, the topic of God and consciousness. So one of my burning questions about God is something I can't even articulate properly because, uh, you know, I'm using concepts that are of third dimensional reality that, you know, include the concept of time, creation, destruction, beginning and an end. But I don't know how else to describe my question, but the question is still there. So I wonder if lucid dreaming can answer this question, which is who created God and then whoever created God, who created them, so on and so forth. What is the origins story of God? You know, can we meet God in a lucid dream? Because why not? Right. So, so the, those are all, again, wonderful questions and wonderful things that you could experiment with in a lucid dream. Now, now here's what I would tell most people who are on that path. I, I would say first, uh, what you're going to find in a lucid dream is that normally if you get too excited, you'll pop out of the lucid dream. So it's, it's like there's an inner circuit breaker. If you get too much emotion, whether it's being ecstatic or, or being fearful and depressed or whatever, if it's too much, 
you'll pop out of the lucid dream. It, it's like this, there's a protective mechanism that, that doesn't allow your emotions to go uh, too, too, wet, too far in one direction. So in any case, so normally when people try to find God or Buddha or Allah or whomever, normally they are so excited at the idea of it that normally they'll pop out of the lucid dream. And so unless you're really super experienced, um, I, I, I would say it's, it's, it's not a, uh, going to work very well. But that said, first, I think interacting with the larger awareness is much more valuable. But for example, regarding the creation story, um, I remember um, the facilitator of the ldforall.com lucid dream community, uh, Pascal, told me that one month they had the goal to find the beginning and end of the universe. And because in a Western view of the things, oh, obviously there was a beginning, we call it the Big Bang, and someday possibly there'll be an ending. And so, so what she does, she uh, finds herself in front of a mirror, she becomes lucidly aware, and then she looks in the mirror and basically asks what I would call the awareness behind the dream, show me the beginning and the end of the universe. And suddenly she hears this non-visible voice and it replies, the universe has no beginning and has no end. The universe is an everlasting cycle. And so when you think about it, so a lot of people would say, oh, this larger awareness you're talking about, it's just your subconscious mind just reflecting anything back to you that you believe in from the recesses of your mind. But here you can see that the uh, larger awareness, it disagrees with the premise of her request to find the beginning and end of the universe. It says the universe has no beginning and end. The universe is an everlasting cycle. So in that regard, the universe exists outside of the time uh, dimension uh, is the response that you receive. So, so something like that, if you had a hundred lucid dreamers who all came up with that kind of response when they, when they asked this uh, silly question, uh, that, that'd be an interesting thing. I don't think they all would get the same response because all of them are launching from their own unique perspective. But, but again, I think interacting with the larger awareness is a stepping stone uh, towards going to the deeper places that, that you're talking about. Well, you're, you're, I consider you a black belt in lucid dreaming. So have you um, gotten to a point where you can ask to meet God, uh, whether, you know, I'm not imagining God as a, you know, old man, you know, with a long beard sitting up in the clouds, but, you know, whatever, whoever God is, have you tried to meet God? Because I imagine you have, you know, been doing it for so long that you wouldn't easily get knocked out of a dream and the oh. idea of meeting God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, um, so, so like, here's an example. Uh, one time I became lucidly aware and I realized that the entire lucid dream was projected mental energy. So what, what is a dream? A dream is a mental construct, just like a, a fiction book is a mental construct. Somebody imagined all these characters doing all these wild things and whether it's a mystery or whatever it is, that's, that's just what it was. So I realized within the dream, hey, I'm actually dealing with nothing but projected mental energy. And so then what I did, like a good uh, Tai Chi person, I began to sweep and collect all the mental energy back into me. And the funny thing, that night, I think I had three more lucid dreams that night. Yeah. And I, it was like realizing it was all mental energy and bringing it back into me mm. meant that now I was more energized than I was when I went to sleep in the morning. I would kind of reclaimed that energy. But in another case, one time I became lucidly aware and I reached out to the larger awareness and I said, hey. Let me experience the energy of the universe. And all of a sudden, it was like the dream cracked open. And through that crack was coming this brilliant white energy, this white light just directly into my body. I could feel it accumulating in the palms of my hands and my forehead and across the top of my chest. Wow. And, and, and after about 90 seconds or a minute or something, I, I just said, stop. 
time out. I, I just couldn't take anymore. It it was it was almost um it was almost so energizing that it became painful after after about a minute really? of having this come in. And that thankfully, whenever in a lucid dream when you're interacting with the larger awareness, if you're having an experience that's just too outside of the norm, you can always say stop and and normally uh things uh, immediately grind to a halt. So again, um I began to kind of view things uh, not from that kind of traditional Christian perspective of a God out there who kind of got this thing all fired up and, and all, but, but I, I seem to view it from a different perspective of, of energy. But, but I'll tell you what, what finally started to happen was um, I, I realized that a lucid dream is a creation of, of, of Robert, the, the consciousness Robert, and this larger awareness. I, I could see how they work together to create the lucid dream experience. And then I realized, well, a dream is basically the same way. It's, it's this larger awareness and Robert working together to, to kind of create this experience. And then I realized that, you know, the waking state is also a co-created experience. And in my second book, uh, Lucid Dreaming Plain and Simple, in the final chapter, I have a technique that anyone can use to see how you and I exist right now in a co-created uh, realm where our mental energy gets projected out there and then we relate back to it privately and en masse. So, mm -hmm. so once I started to have that, level of viewpoint after about 20 years of lucid dreaming th then i wondered well if all of these are co-created constructs based on my beliefs and expectations and focus and intent and all that along with my larger awareness then is there a real reality mm -hmm. and and that's when i would fall asleep at night and the entire night would be nothing but blue light and i remember the first time it happened i I woke up and I looked at my dream journal and I thought, what, what do I put in my dream journal? Blue light? The, you know, there is no me, no action, no symbols, no plot. It was just the entire night. Imagine a, a field of blue light. Uh, and so this started happening periodically. And I remember one morning um, I went down to the breakfast table and, and my wife was sitting there and, and she looked at me and she said, she said, Robert, what's happening to you? And, and I asked her why she would ask me a question like that. And she said that the night before she had wakened in the middle of the night and looked at me and she said, I've never seen someone in so much bliss before. What's, what's happening to you? And this was one of the blue light nights. And I told her, you know, I was trying to understand the actual nature of reality. And I was having some pretty uh, strange experiences. But in my book, I go on and on. Uh, there's more things that happened after this, but I think what you get to is um, if you really want to go the distance, you have to let go of yourself. And, and when you realize the self is a construct, it's all the beliefs and self-history and likes and dislikes and emotions and thoughts and ideas. When you're ready to let all that go, then you can experience what I would I would uh, call the the real reality, uh, the 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 reality behind the screen, behind this behind this uh, play that we're all taking part in and take so seriously, and and so so that's what happened to me. Uh, I'll tell you, it was when I. The next day, I felt like I'd almost had a near-death experience without, without, it's like I voluntarily ceased to be. And in voluntarily ceasing to be, then I was shown behind the curtain and, uh, and experienced um, awareness uh, by the viewpoint of awareness itself. And then that's when you realize that behind all of this, it is this uh, interconnected oneness, this awareness that props it all up. But, but so anyway, so, uh, you know, I, I think God is kind of a way of talking about this energetic awareness that, that props all this up. 
but but I, I think sometimes uh, a lot of us who grew up in the um, Christian perspective, uh, which has a lot of really important spiritual teachings, um, also kind of get well, the focus starts to go towards all sorts of things like original sin and all sorts of things that might not be uh, the most helpful as you go deeper into lucid dreaming. Mm, amazing. Wow, there's so much there. So let me uh, start you by uh, start by asking you about the blue light. So what, were you in just this, uh, um, you know, immersive space surrounded by this blue light? What color blue was it? What did you feel? <laughs> Well, um, so first, there wasn't really a me. Uh, uh, just just imagine uh, you kind of let go of self and perceive, like look up into the sky and see blue light. Um, uh, again, there's no action, there's no plot, there is no me. It was, it was just blue light the entire night. And, and so I, I can't really say it like, I was looking at blue light or and I looked this way and that way and it was blue everywhere. It was just blue light that, and there really wasn't a sense of me so much. So, so um, yeah, the, the, the exact blue color, boy, that's, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. Uh, sometimes um, science shows us that we only see so much of the visual light spectrum, that, that there's other uh, levels of light that insects see and you can see in black light and various things, but, but we don't see it all. So in, in some ways, uh, it, it was a kind of, uh, I'll just call it living light, um, if you can imagine a living blue light, but but I, it, it'd be too hard to explain the, the, the coloration. So, you know. So is, so, is it, so is it because that color doesn't exist in our spectrum or the spectrum of what our, our eyes can perceive? You know, our eyes are obviously, our physical eyes are limited. Well, it, it's like it, we, we could go to an art class and I, and I could point at the where on the blue spectrum it appears, but that light, is, that blue is, is dead by comparison mm -hmm. to living light is what I'm trying to get across. And, and so how to make that thing in the art class become living light, uh, I, I just couldn't do. And, and so therefore it wouldn't be quite the same as, as the experience I recall. Yeah, the reason I was asking is because A, I'm just curious about the details of uh, things like that. But also I wondered if it's, you know, our third eye is uh, represented uh, as sort of like an indigo blue. There's like a shade of blue that it, uh, that particular energy center is. Uh, you know, uh, represented as. So I just wondered if it was to do that because our third eye is sort of like a connection to, you know, any, everything beyond this third dimensional reality. Right. You know, it's, it's interesting now, uh, this issue of light um, in different, uh, different spiritual traditions, uh, mm -hmm. like uh, in some, you know, a Buddhist might say, oh, uh, blue light means this particular chakra or, or something like that. And, mm. and, and so uh, um, I, I just don't know if it has anything to do with uh, um, that chakra or the third eye or any of that kind of stuff. Um, mm. And the second awareness, uh, sorry, the second experience you described where you were, uh, were part of this awareness you said, or this awareness kind of like uh, this, uh, opened up and you were you were shown something so exactly what were you shown or is it you know I understand that the things that are not of this reality that are outside of this reality are hard to describe with the language of this third dimensional reality so I totally understand if you can't describe it because it's well, more of an experience so so, so here, here's what happened so so I kept having this blue light experience at night uh, the entire night nothing but blue light and then one night um if you can imagine this um Sometimes in Buddhist iconography, you, you'll see a clear bubble and, and inside will be some meditating monk or something like that. So, so imagine that, that you see me in this clear bubble and there's these two guys who are trying to take me through this very strange space. And, and I want to tell you, I think this space had other dimensional properties that normally we here in 3D reality aren't, aren't used to. 
But in any case, they eventually got me to the to the place, and, and it was kind of this uh, white temple. And, and so I get out, and and now I'm basically lucidly aware. I'm aware. I didn't, can't really say it was a lucid dream, because I don't remember realizing within a dream I was dreaming it, it, this experience just happened. And so I I walk through this uh, white temple, and I turn the corner, and here's this being composed of blue light. And so it's composed of blue light, so I could see through it. So like right now you're wearing a dress, so I can't see past your dress to what's behind your dress. But this beam of blue light, I could see through it, mm -hmm. and it was composed of blue light, had a little bit of a white sash. And I think in the left uh, crook of its arm, it had a uh, three-pronged uh, kind of spear thing. Mm -hmm. And I started to laugh. Because I didn't know if this was a blue light god or a blue light monster or or what this was. It, it was really something just outside of my normal uh, expectation or, or creation. And so, so I thought, well, how should I respond to this? And I remembered in these books by Carlos Castaneda, whenever he uh, confronted uh, what he considered a gate, uh, that then his goal was to get beyond it. So I decided, you know, even though this thing is 16 feet tall and, and is a blue light, whatever, I'm just gonna try to get beyond it. And so I started running and right as I got up alongside it to get beyond it, there was this incredible sound. And when I woke up, I felt like every cell in my body had been altered by this, by this sound. And I don't know why, I had that impression, but that's the impression I had. Wow. Anyway, it's probably a week or two after that. One night I'm falling asleep and, and my larger awareness tells me that if I want to go the distance, then I might cease to be. And, oh. and it was trying to tell me that I might die. And, and I told my larger awareness that here I was at, at that age. And if I didn't come to understand the actual nature of things, that all of this would be just a big tragic comedy that to have gone this far and all. And so I agreed to cease to be. Mm -hmm. And the reason that I could agree to cease to be is I had had so many interactions with my larger awareness and I could see the just enormous creativity that it has that I realized that, that Robert is, is a much, uh, I don't want to say a lesser thing, but 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 I want to say uh, um, you know not, not not that big in the whole big uh, framework of, of existence, and, and so so I agreed to cease to be. So then, what happened? If you can imagine awareness aware within awareness, so imagine awareness aware within a field of awareness, and so this is what you call a non-dual state because there's no Robert and light or awareness and something that's different, that's not awareness. There's awareness within awareness. And so this experience went on for a while and, and uh, these realizations occurred uh, uh, in it. And then boom, it stopped. And there I was standing next to a guy in a robe. And, and I asked him, what was that? Was that a lucid dream? And he said, oh no, to enter a lucid dream, go here. And I stepped into that space and started going through this tunnel of light. And then I knew that I had to go up. And as I was going up, I had all this electrical energy around my head. And then I basically came through the floor, lucidly aware into a lucid dream. But in the morning I woke up and I thought, what was that first part, that, that awareness, aware within awareness? And that's when I felt like, wow, that was like a near-death experience. And that's when I realized that, oh, my larger awareness told me I might cease to be, and that's the only way to get there, to voluntarily agree to let go of self. And then you experience what is not self, and, and you can come to awareness within awareness. But again, this takes a lot of work. It wasn't something that I realized I was doing, except I had the intent that I was trying to understand the actual nature of reality. Yeah, wow. They, oh, wow. I'm just blown away by all of those experiences. And it really corroborates what I was saying before, that lucid dreaming is 
has such potential for us to unlock those secrets that, you know, that those mysteries of our existence that we really can't get to any other way. That's, yeah, I'm just so blown away by that. And that uh, thing about the awareness within an awareness um, actually will uh, tie nicely with a question that I have um, about the movie Inception. Now, I was going to ask you about that a little bit later, but let's go into it now. So for those who don't know, uh, the movie Inception is a, a movie that starred Leonardo DiCaprio in, I think was released in 2010. It's now sort of like a cult classic favorite movie, but it's basically based on the concepts of lucid dreaming. And in that uh, movie, what they reveal is, so basically, uh, well, the, the premise of the movie is that they're using some experimental military based technology to uh, induce uh, their target with an idea so that they can, you know, uh, manipulate him to do some, take an action. And uh, so basically they've got a team of lucid dreamers and Leonardo DiCaprio is one of them. And what they show in that movie is that, so they've, they're running this espionage, you know, corporate espionage with some experimental lucid dreaming military technology. And, um, they have a person who is an architect of the dream. So a real life person who's gonna design the dream that they want their target to go into in a lucid state. And um, what they show is that in uh, that lucid, uh, so in that movie, basically they, they do things like they have a dream within a dream within a dream. So they have layers of dream and the person who creates the dream will stay behind and the rest will go into the dream lucidly. Um, and the reason the creator of the dream stays behind is so that they can kick the others back into waking up from the dream when the time is right. So they do have like, they have like three levels of dream within a dream. And it's a very risky operation. You know, there's a lot of gun, you know, it's typical Hollywood movie, you know, blockbuster with lots of car chasing and guns and whatnot. Um, but it, it made, makes me think, well, my question about a movie Inception firstly was going to be for you you know, what do you think of that movie? How true to reality is uh, that movie to uh, what lucid dreaming really feels like, you know, what, you know, looks like, feels like and all of that and the concepts that they're presented in that movie. You may not remember all of them, but I'll go through them. I've got a little list here. But even before then, because you've talked about that experience you had with the awareness within awareness. So is that really a dream within a dream within a dream? So um, um, the Inception version, of course, is a Hollywood version, yes. and, and, and that's, that's well and fine. I mean, Hollywood yeah. made it, and so they can do what they want with it. Yes. Um, now, now, there is a different way of approaching that. And so, so I'll, I'll explain the approach, but I want to uh, just caution people that um, th they shouldn't take this very far. And so basically, um, imagine that you became uh, aware in a dream tonight that you were dreaming. And then in that dream, you laid down and went to sleep and had another level lucid dream. So, so now this is what I call second level lucid dreaming. And so, so of course, you could repeat that if you, if you were kind of silly and all. But but what you would realize at kind of second level lucid dreaming is that uh, you're kind of in a sense uh, becoming a little bit disconnected from um, um, the 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 home base, if you want to call it that. You're 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 now going further afield, and uh, the 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 way I came to understand this, I a person had told me about a book uh, by a Native American woman. In, in Southern California. And this woman uh, had a shaman uncle. And, and so the men would get together at, at, in their uh, spiritual group and talk about things. And so she was a little kid and she knew when they were meeting and she would go and lean up against the, the sweat lodge or whatever it was and listen to what they were talking about. And so one night uh, she did that, but she did it like seven times. She, and what happened in the morning, she didn't wake up. And so she didn't wake up. They couldn't wake her up. They could tell she was still alive, but she just wouldn't wake up. And, and so then her family went and got the shaman uncle who realized that something 
interesting must have happened. And, and the shaman uncle uh, had to go into a different state and find her and then eventually uh, bring her back uh, to this uh, dimension uh, reality. So, so again, uh, an actual version and a inception version. I mean, I, I don't even know why I talk about the Hollywood version because it's just the Hollywood version. It's just kind of an imagined mm -hmm. version. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the reason I mention is because it's the only movie that I can think of where they've actually even looked at the idea of lucid dreaming and it is part of the popular culture. So I always wondered as to what you thought about it because you obviously uh -huh. are the real deal, not the Hollywood <laughs> version of it. But I well, wondered, it, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so uh, when I'm watching the movie, I'm thinking, well, if I was a good lucid dreamer and someone was shooting a lucid dream gun at me, I would know that those were lucid dream bullets and there was nothing really to be worried about. Mm -hmm. And I, I wouldn't be going on in that way. Also, I wouldn't be smashing cars together. I mean, they're dream stuff and, and why just smash them together? You know, mm -hmm. it's, it, it might be uh, an ego fun moment but, but in the whole big scheme of things, uh, it didn't, didn't really matter. Now, they did get to the, the, the deeper issue of whether you could either plant an idea in someone's mind mm -hmm. in, in this kind of uh, unconscious state or subconscious state of lucid dreaming, or whether you could extract information from somebody else's. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, so, so that, that, to me, uh, seemed uh, the one legitimate uh, thing that came out of the movie was just uh, exploring that idea. Yeah, and that was actually one of my questions for you, uh, that, which you've already answered, which is that, you know, that movie is really, uh, they, I mean, it's really an example or they're really showcasing how lucid dreaming can be used for nefarious purposes rather than for good. You know, that's what they're really exploring there. And it's interesting what you said about how, you know, in a lucid dream, if somebody was trying to, you know, uh, kill you, you were just sort of, you know, you know, it's not going to happen. It's a lucid dream. But I think the way they got around that, and it was tied in with one of my questions, but I think you've answered it um, uh, in what you just said already, which is that in the movie, what they show is that their military technology, the uh, experimental technology that they're using to, uh, to go into a lucid dream is basically some sort of a sedative. And the one of the things that they reveal in the movie is that Leonardo DiCaprio's wife uh, or his character's wife um, uh, goes into a limbo state. And uh, the limbo state occurs when you go into a lucid dream using this uh, sedative and you get killed inside a lucid dream. It puts you in an infinite subconscious uh, world forever. A scary thought, not? Uh, yes. Um, yeah. So it, that's what happens to his wife. So she's like um, completely like gone. You know, she's not there anymore. And um so I think that's probably how they got around that particular problem because uh, there's no such thing though, is there, in lucid dreaming? Like if you get killed in a lucid dream, uh, which is what nightmares are like, you know, sometimes you have nightmares, you don't you don't actually die, you just wake up. That's what normally happens. So, so uh, exactly. Um, I, I, I've yet to meet a lucid dreamer who's died in their lucid dream and not wakened uh, in the morning. So. Uh, oh, you you I, do I, know. I, I don't know of any. Oh, you don't uh, know. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you don't <laughs> know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so they've all come back to life and uh, jumped out of bed and 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 had, uh, yeah. had toast and coffee in the morning. Yeah. So, uh, um, but but it is interesting. Um, um, so for here, here's a um, an example that kind of gets to something um, that, that you brought up. So so um, uh, well. One uh, holiday, I was home for Christmas, and and I asked my young niece if she'd ever had lucid dreams. She was about twenty years old, and she told me, "Oh, she, she had had ten or fifteen, but they didn't mean anything." Oh wow! <laughs> that that really alarmed me when she said they didn't mean anything. And, and I said, well, "Well, what do you do in a lucid dream?" And she says, "Oh, if I'm in a bad part of town, I'll I'll paint up the buildings and and throw in flowers and stuff, and I'll just create a happier place uh, that, that, than what I found." Mm -hmm. And I said, well, if you, if you want to find out if it has meaning, uh, then, then this is what you should do. The next time you become lucidly aware, just shout out, hey, dream, show me something important for me to see. And that's what I'd suggest to anyone watching this who's a good lucid dreamer. Just stabilize the lucid dream, shout out, hey, dream, show me something important for me to see. So uh, a few weeks later, she's being chased by a lion. She hides behind a rock. 
the lion's jumping over the rock and she realizes that lions don't run free in Kansas City. So this, this must be a dream. And so she stops the lion from flying through the air and then she announces, dream, show me something important for me to see. Mm -hmm. And suddenly this blue hallway appears and at the end of it, it's a little white haired lady and she walks down there and, and it's her great grandmother, Nunu, who passed away when she was like three years old. Mm -hmm. And Nunu says, Jane, you have such wonderful timing. And, and my niece Jane said, what do you mean I have wonderful timing? And great grandmother said, I get out of purgatory tomorrow. And, and so, you know, purgatory, of course, is a kind of limbo space, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, according to uh, the, the Catholic Church, I believe, and, mm -hmm. and some other branches of Christianity, where a person who has some sins that they still need to repent from or, or something, they get put in kind of, they're not quite in heaven, they're not quite in hell, they're kind of in this limbo space called purgatory. And, uh, and so Jane in the morning, she had to ask me, what's this purgatory thing? Because she, she was so unchurched, she didn't really have an idea of what that was. But anyway, at the very end of their encounter, the great grandmother brings up something that Jane is not aware of and asks Jane to talk to her mom about it. Mm -hmm. And so in the morning, Jane calls me up and says, what do I do? And I said, you're the one who want to know if lucid dreams have meaning. You've got to call up your mom now and tell her what great grandmother said and see if it has any validity. validity. Mm -hmm. And she called up her mom. Her, her mom burst into tears when she heard what great grandmother had said because great grandmother brought up something that Jane was unaware of, mm -hmm. but was the happiest moments that her mother had spent um, wow. with Nunu uh, when she was a girl. And so I asked Jane, well, why was this important to you? Because you asked, show me something important for me to see. And she told me that her her father, uh, when she was born, her father shortly thereafter uh, uh, became terminally ill with with a long term illness, and everyone was always saying he's going to die soon. He'll die soon. He'll die soon. I, I think he passed away when she's about twenty or so. But uh, so she said, ever since I was a little kid, I wondered what happens to you when you die. Mm -hmm. You know what happens to you when you die. So it may be uh, that people. Some people do go into some sort of limbo or purgatory, but again, it might be uh, just uh, much more complicated than, than we could reason out. But the interesting thing is some people in lucid dreams have explored this. And in my first book, there's a chapter on interacting with the deceased in lucid dreams. And my friend, Ed Kellogg, he would um, go try to find uh, friends and acquaintances who were recently deceased and discover what they were doing and what they were thinking and what they were aware of in a lucid dream. And, and then he would wake up and share the information with the family. And oftentimes the family would tell him that, that Ed had picked up things about their loved one that nobody else knew. And, and sometimes they would just laugh with, with all the things that uh, Ed had learned. But again, uh, the, it's not conclusive because you might just be dealing with your larger awareness, but it does seem to indicate that something happens after we pass away and it's not the total end. Yeah, no, I definitely believe it's not the total end. This is, you know, third dimensional is just one reality where we exist. Um, so, yeah, I, I totally believe that we are able to connect with those that have passed away, whether it's through lucid dreaming or some other form, you know, we are eternal in that sense. Yeah, so with that, um, so in that movie, there's another concept that I wanted to ask you about, which is um, the dreamers carry a totem, which is that, you know, because they do this multi-level of nested in dreams, they, like you said, you know, that uh, lady that you said the shaman had to bring, um, like, you know, she'd gone into several levels of dreams. So you get uh, sort of disconnected from your reality base. So um, the dreamers in that movie carry a totem, which is an object that the dreamers use to test whether they're still dreaming or they're back in their reality. And in that movie, they have a very, really uh, frustratingly clever ending to that movie, which is that the main character of Leonardo DiCaprio is back in his reality after having done his espionage, you know, and um, his totem is a spinning top. So when he comes home, he uh, spins the top on a table, but then he walks away. He doesn't turn around to look if because the spinning top is supposed to stop spinning 
if he's back in reality, but if he's in a dream still, it will uh, in, you know, indefinitely spin. But he just spins it and he walks away and then um, he doesn't look back to see what happens and the camera just pans on to the spinning top and the credits roll. So we don't know whether he's really back in reality or he's lost in the multi-level dreaming where he's really become untethered from the reality base. So which made me think um, that, you know, with dream within a dream idea, that how do we know, perhaps, or how do we know, well, is it possible, let's say, that um, when one of the reasons why we have to go to sleep at night, apart from, you know, physically, we have to rejuvenate and renew ourselves to, to survive. But perhaps one of the main reasons we have to sleep is because when we're sleeping here, we're dreaming over there. But when we wake up, uh, we're sleeping over there and we're dreaming here. And that's just how we are. Like how, maybe that's how human existence is, that we exist in those two places equally uh, and they're, equal, they're equally real and valid to the person on the other side. So perhaps the Rima who was sleeping at night um, was in the other on the other side, but now that I'm awake here, the other Rima in the dream space is actually sleeping. Is that a possibility? <laughs> So, so I, I think there is some scientific research uh, to suggest that dreaming goes on 24 hours a day. Oh. That, yeah. that it's not so much that we um, have a dream. It's, it's maybe more that we focus on the level of awareness where dreaming occurs. Mm. And and then we leave that level of awareness and we call it, oh, the dream, it came to an end. But the dream did come to an end. It's just that our focus shift, our awareness shifted, and we return to the uh, waking state. And, and so, uh, so, so again, uh, it's, it's more complicated, I think, than most people mm. would assume. Mm. Uh, one thing that is a little bit interesting when you kind of sit down and think about it, so most of us can't remember being born, can't remember day one. We kind of come into a memory of self, you know, when we're two or three or whatever it is and, and all. And it's also like when you start to try to recall a dream. So what happened the moment before the dream began? Well, gosh, I really can't remember what happened the moment before the dream began. And, and it, it's kind of like you remember the dream maybe in the middle or the most, uh, you know, emotionally fraught part. And, and then you can kind of remember it working forward and backwards. Mm -hmm. But the beginning, what happened the moment before the beginning, you, you really don't see. And, and so, uh, so, so it's kind of interesting that life is much like that as well, that uh, uh, it's rare when you meet somebody who remembers anything that occurred in the first year of their life. And uh, it's as much, uh, and that's how it is with the dream state as well. Mm, yeah, yeah, it's such a deep rabbit hole because it is very complex, like you said. And I think uh, I can't help but entertain some of those complexities. And now that you, ha I have you there, I have to ask all those questions. Because the other idea I also had is, um, which I'm sure is not new, is that, you know, uh, with the idea of dream within a dream, it could possibly uh, also be another evidence for the simulation theory that we're living in a, you know, matrix um, where, you know, uh, the dreams that uh, every exit uh, in a, multi-dimensional universe every dimension that we're existing in simultaneously is basically a dream that we're having and it's whether we are in an inner nested dream or a higher upper level dream and I wondered because one of the patterns I've noticed with dreaming is and please correct me if I'm wrong but in dream time uh, time runs faster and one of the things that they showed in the Inception movies also, that when they go into the more nested level in a dream, the time goes faster and faster. So I wonder if the time, uh, so if, the, if we are in a, in a state, which what, let's, say, let's say this is a dreaming state as well, another yeah, waking reality is just another dreaming state that's nested in within other dream dreams that if the time here is slower then it could possibly mean that we're in the more upper level dream because as the time goes slow we are in the, in the further upper level of dreams and then when we come outside the entire dream loop basically there's no time so it could have sort of explained uh 
you know, the matrix, the simultaneous, uh, the, uh, the simulation theory. So your thoughts on that? <laughs> so, uh, um, it, um, so Stephen LaBerge uh, did one research uh, piece on this particular thing. So uh, again, the, the way um, lucid dreaming became scientifically validated mm -hmm. is through what they call the eye, eye signal verification technique. So they'd bring lucid dreamers into the sleep lab. They told them when you become consciously aware, move your eyes left to right eight times, and that'll show up on the rapid eye movement polygraph pad, and, and that'll provide evidence for lucid dreaming. And, and so Stephen LaBerge brought some people into the lab. He said, okay, signal with your eyes when you're lucidly aware, and then signal with your eyes when you're beginning the experiment, count to 10, and then signal with your eyes again so that we'll see if 10 seconds in the lucid dream state is like 10 seconds in the waking state. And of course, uh, what they found was that it was basically exactly similar to what the waking state uh, version was. However, I don't think that's the end, um, end study uh, on, on the actual nature of time. Well, one, one time uh, I was with some friends uh, in a convertible and uh, we drove off the road and hit a bump and I flew out of the back seat and all of a sudden here in waking reality, as I'm flying through the air towards a barbed wire fence, suddenly time began to slow down because I realized, oh, I'm going to fly right into that barbed wire fence. And every microsecond was very slow as I watched myself uh, hurtle towards the uh, barbed wire fence. So, mm -hmm. so what I'm trying to get across here is that time has psychological value to it. Right. Uh, if, you, if somebody asks you the most important question in your life, maybe time would shut down. Or if you won the lottery, maybe time would slow down or speed up or God knows what. Time is another uh, construct, uh, just like space. And, and so space and time can be influenced by the psychological uh, nature of the person who's having the experience. So, so uh, when it comes to timing, you know, that's one of those things. Mm -hmm. However, uh, you do have a good point, though, that in lucid dreams, if you're a good lucid dreamer, you can begin to interact with probable selves or what you might call simultaneous selves, uh, the simultaneous self who went to a different college, or the simultaneous self who got married, or the one who didn't get married, or whatever it is, that they're all branching out there and, uh, and all. So, so it, in that magazine that I uh, co-edit with my friend Lucy Gillis up in Canada, Lucy, if you'll go through and read her articles, oftentimes she'll bring up uh, how in lucid dreams, she'll meet probable Lucy's, what ones who did something uh, mm -hmm. other than the official Lucy, and uh, they'll have interesting conversations. So, so again, I think the nature of the self is so much more complicated than, than we even fathom. Mm -hmm. And uh, space and time, yeah, that's a little bit complicated, but uh, I, I think the self that has the experiences is, is, is really the true uh, miracle there. Mm, yeah, no, I, and I totally agree with the, uh, what you said about the psychological influence of uh, the, uh, what psychology, uh, the, how psychology influences uh, how time runs, of the speed it runs. Because you know that saying, time flies when you're having fun, it's absolutely true. And if you're, let's say, doing something really boring, you just keep looking at the clock and you're like, oh my God, it's only five minutes since I last, last checked the clock. You know, the clock just doesn't want to move. So yeah, time definitely uh, feels altered depending on how, how we are what emotions we're having and and, and where, you, where you'll see this is uh, sometime a lucid dreamer will, will write that uh, they got awakened by the alarm and so they hit the snooze mm -hmm. and so now they have eight minutes before they're going to wake up and they have a lucid dream and then they have this incredibly long lucid dream mm -hmm. that most of us would say took 20 minutes to occur mm -hmm. but because the alarm goes off eight minutes later they know that somehow all of that activity occurred uh, within the course of eight minutes of of waking time, but in that dream space, in that kind of psychological time, it, it was much vaster uh, and, and much more, much longer 
Yeah, I've noticed that as well when uh, not with lucid dreamings, but just dreaming in general. Sometimes I'll have a dream that literally feels like it's run the entire course of the night. So if I've slept for eight hours, it seems like it's run for eight hours. But when I try and remember what I did in that dream, I didn't do that much. You know what I mean? Like how could have taken eight hours? So it's like the time was really slow. So I just did two things and it took me a whole eight hours. So yeah, time is a funny thing. And, you know, I feel like I wonder if we'll ever really understand it. And speaking of time, maybe this is a good point, uh, segue into reincarnation, because it is, again, also connected with the concept of time. So I understand that there was a time in your life where you tried to, um, uh, in, you know, investigate through your lucid dreaming practice what reincarnation is all about and how it works. So is there anything that you can share with us from that line of inquiry? Well, Actually, I would say it was the other way around. Um, I think that I grew up in the middle of America, in the middle of the U.S., mm -hmm. and uh, grew up in a traditional uh, Protestant family. We'd go to church on Sunday and all that kind of stuff. And, mm -hmm. and uh, when I was a young guy, um, so in, in our family, we never had alcohol. My mm -hmm. parents never had alcohol in the house. Yeah. And I remember when I was probably... Um, maybe 12 or 13, um, I found myself looking through the eyes of this older man. And, and I could see his big, thick, stubby hands and his wool jacket. And I could see that in his right hand, he had a glass of, of red wine. Mm -hmm. And I, I looked around and I could see the, the, uh, his apartment. And, and I, I think there were gas lights on the walls so gas lights you know that's like 1898 1900 something like that and all of a sudden i realized that oh i, th I think we're in holland even though i'd never been to holland never been out of the country and, and i think i think the uh dock is is right behind uh, where this man is seated uh in, in his apartment but the funny thing was all of a sudden he brings up the glass of red wine to his mouth to take a drink but i experienced the taste of this red wine it was so good it burst in my mouth or his mouth and when I woke up as a little kid I thought wow. oh my god is that what wine tastes like this is incredible <laughs> and, and so so since that in my in my waking life uh, now I, I probably had that happen maybe four or five times when I've had wine that's so good it it burst mm -hmm. in my mouth but but here's the thing as a little kid back then it made me think how am I having this experience? Mm -hmm. How am I looking through someone else's eyes and seeing their reality in this way? And what I realized later on was I think my larger awareness began to have me have these memories of other lives so that I would break free of that traditional belief mindset of the protestant church that oh you just have one life and that's it and you go to your just rewards whether you die at age three or age 30 or age 93 it's all the same uh, you know you just had that one chance and, and there you go and and so um in lucid dreams um um after a while i, I began to explore this and uh and all i i wrote a chapter on it and um my editor took it out of the first book mm -hmm. uh, but but uh, but this is another thing that a person can work with in a lucid dream. And sometimes the amazing thing is you can verify things when you wake. And and it's it's a mind blower to, uh, yeah. you know, go to some of these places and still see the geological features that haven't changed in thousands of years and, and realize that, oh, my God, you were there you know, in 1678. And, and it's, it's just a mind blower. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine because I think I love those kind of experiences, because they remind us that we're so much more than, you know, this third dimensional reality, you know, that we experience on a daily basis. So I can't get enough of those experiences just for that fact, you know, that they're reminders, they keep you tethered to that knowing that you are so much more. Um, so let's uh, delve into the, um, so you touched on the science, uh, some of the scientific studies that have been done, you know, using, uh, uh, you know, detecting those passions with the eye movement, did you say? 
you know, uh, yeah. So, um, so with the scientific research side of things, when did, uh, so it, was it in the 1980s that science really started to take notice of lucid dreaming? And if so, what, what triggered that? Well, um, so, so the first uh, valid scientific experiments occurred at the University of Hull, uh, where Keith Hearn, who was a grad student working with a lucid dreamer named Alan Worsley. Mm -hmm. And so that was like April 12th of 1975. Mm -hmm. And so I also, in the spring of 1975, uh, that's when I learned how to induce lucid dreaming by looking at my hands. Mm -hmm. um, but, this, but the evidence didn't really come out until Stephen LaBerge began to um, uh, publish his papers. And this was really 1980, 81. Mm -hmm. And I remember being a psychology student stopping at the uh, college library and looking at the January 1981 issue of Psychology Today. Mm -hmm. And here's this article about Stephen LaBerge's research that he proved lucid dreaming existed. Because for years, I'd been telling people I was becoming consciously aware in the dream. And they said, oh, you can't become conscious in the unconscious. Or you're having a dream about being aware in a dream. Mm. And I go, no, I, I'm aware in the dream. I'm doing this and that and all. So, so Stephen LaBerge came out with the evidence in 1980, 81. And people really ran with it. And uh, it, it's, there's been a lot of research done in lucid dreaming since then. So with our, uh, what's some more recent discoveries or advances that have been made um, by the scientific community in the area of lucid dreaming that, you know, that you know of? Well, um, so, so uh, I'll just go through a little bit there. Uh, one person, uh, Ursula Voss in Germany, she, she wondered, when does lucid dreaming spontaneously happen, if at all? And so she uh, interviewed, I believe, 594 German school children ages 6 to 19. And, and she discovered that little kids as young as six were having spontaneous lucid dreams. Mm -hmm. They, of course, didn't call it a lucid dream, but they knew that they were consciously aware of dreaming mm -hmm. while in the dream state. And, yeah. and I think like 20% of the eight-year-olds had already had a spontaneous lucid dream. And she'd give examples of what these were. So the reason I want to bring that up is to say that lucid dreaming is natural mm -hmm. and it occurs spontaneously. You don't have to learn about it necessarily. For a lot of people, it just is part of their dream life, but we don't talk about dreams much as a culture. And, and so therefore uh, the information doesn't get out there. Yeah. Then there's been studies on the neurological aspect of lucid dreaming. So you know what a EEG, an electroencephalogram skull cap is. They put all those little sensors and, and record your brain activity. Mm -hmm. And so they'll record a person while they're consciously aware. And their cerebral cortex, the upper layer of the brain, is quite active. Mm -hmm. But in the dream state, that same person, their cerebral cortex is very non-active. But when they signal with their eyes, hey, I'm lucidly aware here, Suddenly, the cerebral cortex uh, lights up, especially the frontal lateral portion lights mm -hmm. up, and they can see that, oh, look at this, that they called it a hybrid state of consciousness, because they, they never see this in other neurological studies, that the dreaming brain is active, mm -hmm. while the parts of the conscious brain are suddenly getting activated at the same time. And mm -hmm. that's why those researchers, Ursula Voss, Jalen Hobson, and others, uh, called it a hybrid state of awareness, um, hybrid state of consciousness. So, so anyway, uh, there's a lot of research out there. There's just tons of research on lucid dreaming, but mm -hmm. that just gives you a little bit of a flavor uh, of yeah. some of the research. So with um, uh, tied in with the you know advances in uh, lucid dreaming, uh, one of the things that I've noticed in the last many years that uh, there have been a lot of um, uh, gadgets and devices and pills and herbs that have come into the market to help people induce uh, uh, to go into a lucid dreaming to aid with that. Now, um, for those who don't know, the the devices basically look like um, there could be a sleeping mask or a little headband that produces these like electrical. Um, it gives you basically a visual and tactical stimulation and uh, based on you know some light that flickers and things like that and there's also herbs and pills that you can take now i'm personally quite sort of wary of these things because i don't know how regulated they are by some sort of governing regular regulatory body that makes sure that uh 
proper clinical studies have been done to ensure their safety and their um, efficacy as well, but more importantly, their safety because of any short-term or long-term side effects. So what do you think of the whole trend around that and also the safety side of things? Well, I, I will say that uh, when it comes to some of these herbs and supplements and teas, a lot of it is is bunk. It's they may result in vivid dreams, mm -hmm. but vivid dreams are not lucid dreams. Yeah. I can have a vivid dream, but I'm not consciously aware of dreaming. It's mm -hmm. just that, oh, I wake up and boy, that was really vivid. Those colors were vivid. Mm -hmm. That's not a lucid dream. So you have to be very careful. Uh, I, I would say 80% of the stuff out there isn't going to help a person have a lucid dream. Mm -hmm. But let's say you did find some supplement that works to help a person have lucid dreams. Mm -hmm. Then in some regards, you're having a chemically influenced lucid dream. Mm. And I'll tell you, a chemically influenced lucid dream is different than a natural, organic, spontaneous lucid dream mm. because the chemical is influencing the psychological experience. And you just can't get away from that. Uh, of course, you can reduce the chemical and all that kind of stuff and, and play around with it. Now, when it comes to other things like uh, dream mask, um, I, I have kind of a funny story for you. Uh, my first book, uh, Lucid Dreaming Gateway to the Inner Self, came out in about uh, 12 years ago. A and uh, a guy who read it got really excited by it. And he sent me his prototype dream mask that was to flash red lights in your eyes and help you become aware of dreaming because you'd see these red flashes in your dream. And so um, I opened it up and tried to program the thing and I put the face mask on and went to sleep. And that night, nothing happened. And when I woke up, I looked at the machine and I hadn't programmed it. The, the thing just uh, turned off or whatever. So the next night I, I spent a lot of time programming the thing and making sure it would work right. I put on the, on the face mask and I'm driving down 13th street and it's snowing. And all of a sudden the car in front of me they go into the ditch and their red lights are flashing. And I think, red lights? Oh yeah, that dream mask was supposed to flash red lights. Oh, this is a dream, I'm dreaming. Mm -hmm. And so I flew out of my car and went on and had a great lucid dream. Mm -hmm. But when I woke up, I looked at the machine and it hadn't worked correctly. It, I still hadn't programmed it correctly. It was just my expectation to see red flashing lights uh, ha had entered into the dream space and helped me become lucidly aware. But but there are some you know there are some dream masks out there uh, that purport to tell you you know when you're in rapid eye movement they'll flash lights in your eyes or or make a sound or something. And uh, you know that that's a fine way if you need a, an aid. Uh, mm -hmm. Having a dream mask like that uh, seems like a fine idea. Um, no one needs to write me and ask for recommendations because I'm not going to recommend any particular brand or anything. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, I, I learned the old fashioned way of just uh, doing the techniques and uh, by using my mind and, and using my intent and focus, uh, I learned how to have spontaneous lucid dreams. And, and so I hope people will try that first before they uh, try these other things. Yeah, I, I'm with you on that. I prefer the old fashioned way, but you know, it's a personal choice, but I just kind of feel a bit worried about these uh, devices and pills because I feel like, uh, do we really know what their long-term side effects are? You know, what are the clinical studies that ensure, ensure their safety? Because nothing might uh, happen in the short term, but what happens in 10 years time? You know, do we know that? Right. Yeah, so that that's where I'm coming from. So yeah, I'm definitely with you on that uh, on so many levels. So with um, uh, I was going to go into uh, you know the more practical applications of uh, lucid dreaming, such as manifesting and healing and you know enhanced learning. But I really want to do a part two with you, uh, Robert. So if we can perhaps um, do a deeper dive in. Uh, more about lucid dreaming that is targeted towards you know people who really already have a practice and want want to take it to the next level so you know more questions around stabilization of dreams and you know those tips and tricks and different techniques that a person can use talking about the old-fashioned way you know what are the techniques that you recommend and have worked the best for you at different levels of lucid dreaming practice and so I'm thinking perhaps yeah if we can do a part two um and go into some of those topics. And for today, I just want to uh, perhaps close with, uh, 
you know, uh, what does your lucid dreaming practice look like right now? Because I imagine being a black belt in lucid dreaming, do you really need techniques uh, at this point? Do you just literally go, think, oh, I'm going to have a lucid dream tonight? And you do. You, you know, so, so sometimes um, during the day uh, in a quiet moment, uh, uh, I'll have an inner intuition or impulse that I'm going to have a lucid dream that night. And I'd say 99% of the time I, I do have a lucid dream. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do want to say something, though, that that e even though we've spent a lot of time talking about lucid dreaming and all the things you can do, mm -hmm. dream incubation, and that does not require lucidity, but dream incubation, just setting a question to yourself before you go to sleep, tonight in my dream, show me the best way to respond to my boss. Uh, so, you know, my fear of my boss disappears or whatever. Mm -hmm. it, 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 here's a funny, dream incubation is so valuable. Uh, I, I was in Taiwan uh, giving a workshop. Um, my, my books have been translated into Chinese. Uh, so, uh, so the first day of the workshop, uh, a, a woman grabs the mic and, and she, she, she asks in Chinese, can lucid dreaming help me lose weight? I've been trying to lose weight for 10 years. I've never been able to lose weight. I always gain it back. Can lucid dreaming help me lose weight? And, and so I started to laugh because it was such a uh, such a beautiful beginning to, to this uh, wild weekend. And, and so I told her, I go, look, you don't have to have a lucid dream to discover why you can't lose weight. Tonight, before you go to sleep, ask your dreaming self, say dreaming self, tonight, give me a dream that'll clearly, clearly show me why I have been unable to lose weight. Mm -hmm. And all you have to do is remember that dream and wake up with it. And so the next morning she comes down and before the uh, class starts, she grabs the microphone again and tells the class that she did exactly as teacher said. And she told her dreaming self that's what she needed to dream about. Mm -hmm. And that night she dreamt she was a puffer fish. And so a puffer fish, of course, expands whenever it feels threatened. It gets bigger, and so it scares away the other fish. And, and I looked at her and said, so do you understand the beliefs that, that are embedded in that dream? And she said, yes, she understood that she couldn't lose weight wow. as long as she believed she had to be a big woman so she won't get pushed around. Mm -hmm. She was sick of getting pushed around. I'm sick of getting pushed around. I don't care how how big or little you are, people don't like to get pushed around. Mm -hmm. But for her, the way to uh, stop that from happening was to gain weight. And now in this dream, it showed her that if she wanted to lose weight, mm -hmm. she had to re-evaluate her beliefs about getting pushed around mm -hmm. and realize that it wasn't weight that kept her from getting pushed around. It wow. was uh, a other psychological aspect. So again, um, the point I'm trying to get to here is Dreams are extraordinary. Mm -hmm. Dreams connect us with deeper layers of ourselves. And dream incubation, if you can't be a lucid dreamer, anyone can incubate a lucid, anyone can incubate a dream and begin to get information from their larger awareness and, and learn from it. So, so uh, even though we're talking about lucid dreaming and that's great, mm -hmm. um, I, I do want to say that, that dreaming in and of itself is extraordinarily valuable. Yeah, no, thank you for saying that. I think that's really profound. And I've had a lot of dreams in my life that have answered questions for me or given me insights or even, you know, deceased past loved past ones have come into the dreams. And it's been such a, you know, beautiful, uh, heartwarming experience that I really needed at the time. So just dreams in general are such an amazing tool with such enormous potential. And we have to really pay attention to them and really try to learn their language. Yeah. Yeah. Well, great. Well, I'd love to come back and uh, we can go into part two and get into all these other uh, practical aspects of using lucid dreaming yes, uh, to, please. to help us in this waking life. And give us some techniques that we can try for those of us who struggle and those who are way ahead of us in the lucid dreaming game. So um, before we go, um, uh, Rob, can you just uh, talk to us about, you run workshops, um, you're a, a coach uh, for, you know, you help, uh, you coach people with their lucid dreaming practice. So you run workshops online and in person as well. So please tell us what people can expect from your workshops. And uh, I understand you have one running at the moment. So, um, and if you have one coming up, please tell the audience all about that. Yeah, so um, 
uh, my website where you can find out what I'm up to is at lucid-dreaming-advice, lucid-dreaming-advice. Mm -hmm. And uh, so some of the uh, workshops are ones that are just self-paced. You can mm -hmm. listen to them at any time. You'll see me giving talks, uh, explaining all the techniques, mm -hmm. explaining how to respond once you become lucidly aware, and then how to approach uh, whatever it is that you're interested in, mm -hmm. whether it's accessing creativity or emotional healing or promoting physical health or mm -hmm. our spiritual practices or whatever you're into. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so those, there's various ones that just run themselves and whenever you want. Uh, there's others that are done um, in association with glidewing.com. Um, probably mm -hmm. twice a year, I'll do something with them. Uh, probably twice a year, I'll do something with IONS, which mm -hmm. is the Institute of Noetic Sciences uh, right. here in the States. And, and th then there's other venues where people have me come. But some are um, focused more on the beginner. Mm -hmm. Some are focused more on the intermediate and advanced. But I'm always happy to meet people wherever they are and uh, because we were all beginners at one time. Yes. And uh, we'll, we grow from there. Well, I'll provide all the links below to uh, where people can also, you know, purchase your books, um, both of them. And, um, you know, you've got, uh, you've also got another website called lucidadvice.com. So is that still where they can go and, you know, get more information from? Right. That, that would be another place you could find uh, information. Mm -hmm. And also anyone can sign up for our free online magazine called the Lucid yeah. Dreaming Experience. Uh, it's, the best uh, website is luciddreamingmagazine.com. It's a free online magazine and we have 20 years of quarterly issues mm -hmm. uh, that you can read through and get inspired by. Yeah, and I'll, I'll put all the links below in the description bar for every everyone who's inspired today to either recommence their lucid dreaming practice or start their lucid dreaming practice or to advance it to the next level. Thank you so much for being my guest today and joining me today, Rob. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I've only had a few lucid dreams in my life, but I'll always remember the euphoria I felt in that moment when I realized that I had become lucid in a dream. I truly believe that lucid dreaming is the missing puzzle of our life that has been forgotten in the midst of time, but has been kept alive by the Buddhist tradition of dream yoga and people like Robert Wagner who have dedicated their life to lucid dreaming practice and sharing his knowledge and wisdom generously with all of us. Lucid dreaming can help us tap into our superhuman potential for manifesting, healing ourselves instantly and to attain enlightenment. And if you're intrigued by the idea of human potential for superpowers, please do check out my video on this topic here or here. So have you had a lucid dream before or are you a regular lucid dreamer? And if so, please comment below and share with us your tips and tricks and experiences. In the meantime, if you enjoyed this episode, please do check out Robert's website, lucidadvice.com, where you can find links to purchase his best-selling books, Lucid Dreaming Gateway to Inner Self and Lucid Dreaming Plain and Simple, which are available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and IndieBound. The books are also available on Kindle and an Audible MP3 formats. Subscribe to his free online Lucid Dreaming magazine called The Lucid Dreaming Experience, a great resource for lucid dreamers I highly recommend. And check out his online workshop if you are ready to commit to a lucid dreaming practice or you want to take your practice to the next level. I'll provide all the links below in the description bar. So will you have a lucid dream tonight? Wishing you all sweet lucid dreams. So until next time, thanks for watching.